thanks for joining us for the uh, Dinovirus Hemorrhagic Disease webinar presented by Kylie Thacker. Kylie, do you go by Dr. Thacker? Uh, officially, but no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So it's Kylie. Kylie Thacker is the BC Wildlife Veterinarian. She leads the BC Wildlife Health Program in the Fish and Wildlife Branch of the BC Ministry of Forests. Kylie grew up on Vancouver Island and has had a love for wildlife and wild places from a young age. After a brief stint in wildlife biology in BC, she moved to New Zealand to go to vet school and then to work in mixed animal practice. She's never really been able or willing to stay away from wildlife in BC and has worked with BC Wildlife Health Program in various capacities since 2008. Her role as BC Wildlife Veterinarian began in 2020. When not working, Kylie spends her time trail riding, trail running, or out on the ocean around the Gulf Islands. So I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, Kylie and I kind of had a giggle this weekend because the date kind of crept up on us and neither of us realized when we set this for Monday the 10th that it was uh, Thanksgiving. So um, so those of you that have joined, we appreciate you taking the time out of your, the last of your weekend. Uh, I just want to do a quick little overview of how we operate webinars here. Um, and so I'd like you to all get familiar with uh, the buttons on your screen. I'm talking to our uh, viewers. So there's a Q&A and there's a chat. There's a raise hand. Um, here's how we roll. Kylie will do a presentation on AHD. And then we're going to open it up to questions and answers. I like people to be able to participate and um, dialogue verbally with our presenters. So you will need to watch, put your question in the Q&A or your, you know, a comment up in the chat. I will, um, as I go through the list of questions, I'm going to promote the person with the question to panelist. And that's going to allow you to come on screen. You'll want to find your mute button and, uh, and get handy with that. And then I would like you to ask your question to Kylie directly and, um, and feel free to have some conversation. That's kind of what we like to do is we like to sort of bring things down to, um, to a level where you guys actually get a chance to uh, ask your questions. And then it's not just a me reading Kylie answering. We like it to be a little bit more dynamic. Uh, Kylie, it does to end, it does tend to add a few minutes um, to our webinars, but um, we are aiming for that 90 minute mark and we'll see how we do along the way. So uh, Kylie Thacker, wildlife veterinarian, thank you so much and welcome. Great, well, thanks for having me. It's uh, always nice to be able to tell people what we do as the wildlife health program and what we learn along the way. So this is uh, one topic that's taken a lot of time in the last couple of years. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot about it. I don't have that much to say about it at this time. And I'll explain why in some ways that, that uh, there's just been some holdups in learning about this disease over the last couple of years as well in BC. So it's kind of, uh, this is what we know at the moment, but stay tuned, there's more to find out. So. Um, I'm going to be talking about adenovirus hemorrhagic disease and how I'm going to do that today. I'm going to start broadly, talk about wildlife health and why that's important. What is AHD? I'll talk about the history that we know about it. It's a relatively newly discovered disease anyways, and uh, certainly new to BC. So we'll narrow down to our local area at the end. So wildlife health, it, uh, similar to human health, the definition used to include only a freedom of disease. So, we, you know, animals were considered healthy if they didn't have the disease. Now, we've known from human medicine for a lot longer, and it's starting to be to come into the conversation in wildlife health that uh, healthy populations, there's more to it than just freedom of disease. So. And we've included the, to that definition, um, you know, things like body condition, contaminant load, exposure to toxins, reproductive success, population trends, 
um, nutritional status, immune function, all those kinds of things, as well as some social and ecological factors. And this is in animals at the individual scale, at the flock or herd level, and the larger population unit or the entire species. And sometimes we include multiple species in this definition of health and how they interact with each other. So I think our the global pandemic that we've all just gone through and are still going through in some places has really uh, made those topics familiar to us, you know, phrases like herd health, um, population health, that kind of thing. And we know how that now affects us as individuals and our communities in, the, you know, a immunity way, but also in a social context. And that's no different for wild and domestic animals that we deal with. So there are a variety of hemorrhagic diseases known in wildlife. Hemorrhage just means blood loss. So we're talking about diseases that, that may cause blood loss through different routes, but the ones I'll talk about here are um, viruses or caused by viruses. And there's three main ones that we know about in deer in North America anyways. And I'm gonna, in true, government and science fashion talk about uh, or have some acronyms here, but um, often when we talk about hemorrhagic diseases in deer, we're talking about the first two in this these list here. So those are epizootic hemorrhagic disease or EHD and blue tongue. Both these diseases are caused by virus in the genus Orbivirus. Um, a different family from AHD that we'll continue talking about here. So this, the picture on the right there is actually from, uh, it, well, it's a big horn sheep and it uh, was from that blue tongue outbreak that uh, occurred last summer. So similar disease, different virus um, and slightly different clinical signs. So e EHD and blue tongue are transmitted by midges sometimes called gnats or noceums, and it tends to cause a peak of disease in the late summer and fall when those midge populations are at their peak, whereas adenovirus hemorrhagic disease or AHD, you'll sometimes see that written as ODADV, um, is not transmitted by insects, it's transmitted by direct contact. As I said, all these diseases are viruses and they have various routes of transmission. So AHD, what we know about it, it was first detected in 1993 in California in black-tailed deer. Um, since then, there have been pockets of um, outbreaks in California and in some of the other Western states. So in 1999, we saw an outbreak in Wyoming, um, 2001, Oregon, 2015, Colorado, 2017, Washington, and our first detection in BC in 2020. So part of this is that our detection of this disease has gotten a lot better with new technology. Um, and it, sometimes it may have been so diseases or sorry, outbreaks of diseases that caused hemorrhagic signs may have been put down to other causes such as EHD or, or blue tongue and not known to be AHD. Um, or they've gone undetected. You know, as you can see, there's a big gap there in the detection in Oregon and the first detection in Colorado. So what was happening in that time period where we just not finding it um, was immunity built up in the population and we weren't seeing the outbreaks. Hard to say, but uh, some retrospective studies have gone back and um, in the different states and, and looked at what the exposure of this disease is in, in wildlife and um, have found that it's been brewing up the coast anyway since about 1993. So we're seeing with the outbreaks in other jurisdictions that mule deer seem to be the most affected species, followed by white-tailed deer and then other ungulates, so elk and moose. Um, are the cervids that have been affected and also pronghorn in Colorado have, have shown disease. Transmission is by direct contact. So this is animals meeting nose to nose 
um, exposure to bodily fluids, so saliva, urine, or feces, either directly or from contaminated environments, or it can be airborne in droplets. So animals that uh, one of the symptoms is coughing. So if the virus is aerosolized through coughing, it can be infective to other deer in the area as well, or other cervids. There's two forms of the disease that, uh, that we're seeing. And uh, one is an acute form. And it uh, causes, it's, causes disease very rapidly. So animals tend to show symptoms or be found dead within one week of coming in contact with an infected animal. So a week after they're infected, they're either usually very ill or dead. The first symptoms are difficulty breathing, so open mouth breathing, they may be standing with the, their legs wide apart and um, trying to get air into their lungs. They may be lethargic or weak. They may show abnormal behavior, which may be due to that weakness. So being unearthed, they may appear unafraid or unwilling to move um, or unwilling to stand. They may have blood coming from their nose or mouth or foam, sometimes pink tinged foam. Sometimes there's neurological signs or symptoms that include seizures, um, diarrhea, and it may be bloody diarrhea. And sometimes there's no symptoms at all. It's an apparent sudden death with no signs of trauma or illness. So quite often the cases that were reported to me were members of the public that just found a deer dead in their yard looked like it had laid down and died there and had no obvious external signs. So the picture is on the left there of a, a deer I examined. There's, you can see just in the top right photo, there's a bit of foam coming from the side of its mouth and it has bloody diarrhea on the top left there, but otherwise fairly non, nondescript. Then so animals that become infected and recover, they may end up with a chronic form of the disease. And so with these animals, we see them losing weight over time to a point that they may become emaciated. They may have sores in their mouth, which wouldn't be apparent unless you examine them, but you may see them drooling because of those sores or dropping food if they're eating. They may appear weak or lethargic again over time, and they're susceptible to secondary infection. So their immune system's really taxed at this point. So that opens them up to other bacterial or virus infections as they may have symptoms of pneumonia or other things because of that as a result. And those secondary infections may be what kills them. So in the acute form of this disease, how these animals die is that the virus um, attacks the cells that line the blood vessels and causes the blood vessels to become leaky essentially. So they, they slowly lose blood from the vessels, particularly in their lungs and intestines, sometimes their other organs. Um, and so they have localized hemorrhage within the body cavities. So picture here on the right of an infected deer. This is from the Cobble Hill area, an animal I examined. Um, you can see on the, the right side of the animal is the thorax, so the chest cavity and the lungs, and they're quite dark there. And there's a dark red clear fluid in the chest cavity. So that's blood that's leaked from the vessels of the lungs. So very clear signs of the symptoms that we see in the live animal. So at, at necropsy, which just means examination of an animal carcass similar to an autopsy in a human, the classical signs of this disease that we see is, like I described, lungs that appear heavy or full of blood, sometimes fresh blood in the chest cavity, sometimes foam, pink colored foam often in the airways. The intestines may look dark red um, and there may again be that bloody diarrhea. Sometimes the other organs may also look dark red or brown um, and there may actually be 
black feces in the lower intestinal tract. So the diagnosis of this disease is the symptoms in the large animal, which sometimes, you know, they're, the symptoms I described are um, characteristic of the disease, but may also be nonspecific. So meaning that they could also be symptoms of other diseases. So there are other things that cause difficulty breathing in um, deer species or in cervids, for example. Then we look to necropsy findings. And as I described, there's some characteristic symptoms on our findings on necropsy. If samples are collected and sent to the lab for further diagnostic workup, there's um, some signs that they look for under the microscope. So using a technique called histopathology where the tissue is cut in sections that are approximately one cell thick, so very, very thin, the pathologist will look at those slides under a microscope and we'll see what are called inclusion bodies in the endothelial cells, so the cells lining the um, ins inside of the blood vessels. Sometimes we can do a blood test for antibodies, and so we may find antibodies against the adenovirus hemorrhagic disease virus in uh, the serum of infected animals. But the Definitive diagnosis or how we confirm a positive is finding that viral DNA in tissue. So doing a genetic test for that viral DNA. So our first detections in BC were in the fall of 2020 on the Gulf Islands actually. So the first detection detections were on Maine, Galliano and Pender Islands. Shortly after there was spread, or maybe there was already spread, but we were finding it on southern Vancouver Island. And over the course of that fall and over the winter, it spread north at the east coast of Vancouver Island with a peak of cases in the summer of 2021. Um, since then, or since I guess the winter of 2021, 2022, the case slowed, or at least the reports to me of cases have been much lower, um, which hopefully is a good thing, but uh, yet to be seen. I've had more recent reports of suspect cases. So the reason that we may have been seeing a lower case count is either the density of deer has decreased to a point that they're not transmitting it between themselves as much, um, or immunity has built up in the population. So. Um, antibodies against the virus can be passed from a doe to her fawn and colostrum. So there's there's some maternity or some maternal immunity um, that would protect fawns of a young age. Fawns are more susceptible uh, in that they're more likely to die, whereas adult animals may still be infected, but they're less likely to die. They're more likely to develop signs and recover or become chronic, chronically infected animals. As I say, they've had an, an uptick in reports recently, so we'll, we'll be looking into that. So part of what I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this, what we haven't been able to detect cases in the last year is that the um, definitive diagnosis that genetic test for the viral DNA is done at the NBC at the Provincial Agriculture Lab, which flooded last November. So that lab's actually being closed for all diagnos diagnostics until um, a couple weeks ago, actually. So there we had some archived samples from last summer that are now going to be tested. But as I say, the reporting of sus suspect cases has been way down. Oops, sorry, probably. So the impact in BC, and this is, uh, this is some information mostly from the regional or the biologists in region one. So, and they did an inventory this year in April and May with some expected and some unexpected results. And what, what I mean by that is that there were some real hot spots where reports were coming from of suspected animals. So these hot spots included Galliano, Salt Spring Island, Caldwell Hill, Machosen, 
less so, but still high counts in Nanaimo lakes and Parksville areas. Um, and we did see localized decline in some of these areas, which is kind of what has been expected or what we expected based on what was seen in other jurisdictions that have had this disease before us. So it doesn't appear to, to greatly affect the population as a whole, but it does seem to cause very localized small area declines. So there may be, you know, a pocket where no, no fawns are seen for a year or two and then that population immunity builds up in that population and it recovers. So what other jurisdictions are finding is that once this disease is introduced into an area, it tends to start by causing an all age die off, which is again what we've seen in local in some areas in these pockets, um, followed by periods where there may be just be fawns affected um, and fewer adults found dead and then it tends to be cyclic after that so once once it's introduced it tends to be there to stay um, but it's kind of a eight to ten year cycle other places have described of when these outbreaks or kind of flare-ups I guess that the disease occur so we will see what we see here but uh, we've now gone through that I think all age die off. Um, we did have some significant fawn loss in some areas, um, but not in others. So that's where these unexpected results. So this is a note from the region one biologist that did the inventory this spring. And I'll just read what their message was here. So regarding the potential effects of AHD, and this is primarily based off staff observations, but there's a possibility that AHD was a limiting factor in the low elevation areas of, of the Coxsila Shawnigan Division. Some of the transects they did near Louise Lake and Dahl Lake are adjacent to farm farmland um, and on a rural and a country interface. The majority of these transects dropped in deer numbers significantly. However, we had high numbers in transects in the Nanaimo Lakes and Northwest Bay areas at eastern low elevation. These are some areas that we would have expected a higher probability of the disease with rural deer, rural deer, sorry, with AHG congregating with the migratory deer. So unexpected results there. Some of the middle and headwater located transect also showed fluctuations with lows and highs on the South Island. That being said, transects on or adjacent to quality winter ranges remain the same or higher as previous years. The loss of juveniles was noted throughout central and southern Vancouver Island. Um, this was primarily attributed to winter kill via extended periods of cold temperatures and deep snow in December, January, and February, but could also have been attributed to partly to AHD. Of note, many North Island watersheds, West, Central, and Eastern had increasing trends in deer throughout the watersheds where winter, wintering habitat is protected. So um, some of the areas that uh, we had lots of reports of cases or of suspect cases and had a lot of positives, we didn't see those localized declines that were expected, which interestingly, whether that's due to migratory deer moving in, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, with the number of young animals seen, that uh, doesn't seem to be the case. So in 2021, last year's inventory declines were not detected. So say 2022 numbers, there were some declines and this is basically based off staff observations, reports from the Conservation Officer Service, oh, sorry, and reports from the public. So where we're going from here, we actually had funding last year to do a large retrospective study. So we have from every deer that is captured for collaring or for health sampling um, or found dead in BC that, uh, or in Aunt Vancouver Island, sorry, that we have access to, we being the Wildlife Health Program, um, we had archived health samples from. So we 
were successful in securing funding from the Together for Wildlife Fund to have those analyzed for exposure to HD prior to 2020. So looking at when this disease may have actually arrived in BC and maybe trying to figure out a pattern of transmission. So how did it get here? At this point, we have no idea and it's honestly unlikely that, that we would find an answer, um, but we have the samples so we can go back and see what, you know, if antibodies were present in the population before we were detecting the disease. Um, because of COVID, the lab that analyzes these samples in the States was closed. Um, so we haven't been able to, to do this analysis yet, but uh, the samples are actually just being shipped down now. So hopefully we will have results from that soon. And so what can you do as the public or as, so what can we do to stop or prevent this disease? And the main thing that we can do is pre prevent deer from congregating near artificial feed or water sources. And this is similar for a lot of the diseases that we worry about with wildlife is uh, that are passed either by direct contact or by contaminated environments is if we can prevent animals from congregating you know, we can slow that spread. So of course, there's some times of the year and with different species that congregating is natural, you know, animals group together during the breeding season or different times of year. Um, the sexes may group together, but uh, as much as we can prevent that outside of those times, we'll be better off. Proper disposal of carcasses. So if, if you find an animal that you has symptoms or or any animal that dies on your property um, that carcass can be disposed of by burial on the property or it can be taken to the landfill for disposal. Uh, avoid moving carcasses around, avoid moving live animals around particularly particularly if they're infected. Unfortunately with AHD there isn't a test for live animals yet. Um, Hopefully we'll get there, but uh, nothing has been developed yet. If you are handling carcasses or live deer, wear PPE, so wear gloves, clean equipment between animals, wash your hands, um, and especially between handling different individuals. And then report suspicious cases. So if we can get samples from animals, we'll be able to continue to spread the track or track the spread right, of this disease um, and learn from it. So that, that may not result in anything that we can do directly about it, but uh, may help with understanding the progression of this disease in British Columbia and on in the coast region. So who to report these cases to would be me. And I'll put my contact details at the end of this talk that you can write that down. And actually, that's about it. That's uh, that was very short in Sweden. Sorry, Emily. I don't know if we'll hit the ninety-minute mark, but um, this is my contact details. If you do have any questions that you know that you come up with after this time, or uh, want to report a suspicious animal, you can get a hold of me this way, and I am happy to take any questions now. Um, nobody's disappointed at that. that, that. At, at short or long, as far as I'm aware. And we knew going into this, we don't have a lot of information, right? So yeah. that's, uh, you know, that's a, a really big deal. Um, it's pretty new. It'll be really interesting to see what turns up with your sampling and uh, and if it's actually in fact been. <clears throat> Question, have you seen uh, any evidence in, in any other species on the island? Interestingly enough, I we don't have any confirmed positives in any other species. Elk are, are theoretically susceptible, um, and we have you know Roosevelt populations that overlap with areas that we've seen positive deer, and we haven't yet had any positive detections in elk. Just the last few weeks, I've had a couple cases of reports of elk that have died with suspicious symptoms in the Campbell River area. So I have examined those and results are pending. 
Um, but at this point, we don't have any positive detections in any other species. Fallow deer do not appear to be affected. So we've had positive cases in blacktails from Maine Island, but no fallow in the same area. So that's uh, not sure why, but yeah. <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and also interesting, if you are you testing any other um, species samples from prior to in case you're gonna like would you you know test some Roosevelt elk, Roosevelt elk samples to see if you yeah. have yeah antivirus yeah so anything I can't remember off the top of my head what we went back to retrospectively I think around 2016 that we have samples from that uh, we've included in the shipment to be tested retrospectively so from elk and deer awesome I am, uh, I'm going to start to pull up some participants here. So Robin Anra has a question up. Robin, I'm going to promote you to panelist. So just look for that. And I think you're live and good to go. Okay. Um, my question was, uh, um, have they detected, I think I, I got in a little bit late, um, said that pronghorns are can become infected yes yeah that's correct i think it was at colorado has had some cases in pronghorn okay um my question my next question would be do you expect it to reach the mainland of bc i am actually surprised we haven't had cases on the mainland just with um you know, it's been on many of the Gulf Islands and, and some that are quite close. How it got there in the first place, I'm not sure. Um, so it may well be there, but I haven't had any reports or positive cases from the mainland. Okay. Um, I think my last question here is, uh, since a pronghorn can become infected, uh, do you know if a mountain goat or a mountain sheep could become infected? I don't believe so. So there is some... There have actually been some experiments on domestic animals in the States. Um, they have been lambs, I think it was, have been exposed to um, the virus. Either they've been inoculated either through um, nasal contact or actually directly into their, like given an, an injection basically of the virus and seeing if they develop disease and they haven't. Um, I know some cattle have also been tested in areas where there's been an outbreak in wildlife and they also haven't developed disease and they haven't seroconverted, which means they haven't developed the antibodies against the disease. So they don't appear to be susceptible. Um, hope that's the case with mountain goats and wild sheep. Uh, certainly no evidence that they, at this point, that they can become infected, but uh, I don't think any tests have been done on on wild okay yeah. i don't want to be a question hog um <laughs> i was about five minutes late is there have they located um like ground zero or the source of this not in bc no the first cases ever identified in north america or in, or anywhere were in california um as to how it got there or what started it, you know, whether it was a, another disease that mutated and suddenly infected wildlife, I'm not sure, but uh, 1993 in California was the first detection of this disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, um, uh, I have uh, Amanda, and for some reason, when I try to promote Amanda to panelist, um, it boots her out, so I'm going to try one more time. Oh, Amanda, it might have worked that time. Did it? Yes, I'm Can sorry. Can you hear me? I seeing you disappear, and I felt so bad. I'm oh. like, I keep thinking I hit the right button, but anyway. kept kicking know. me off, and I'd quickly try and log back on. <laughs> well, you did good. I think you're your third time. Lucky. <laughs> there you go. Go ahead, Amanda. All righty, so my question is, if we are out hunting and get a deer... Do you want samples from deer that are shot? If so, where do we take samples from and how do we store them before they get to you? Great question. Um, I'm interested in samples from deer that 
look suspicious. So that would ha that have any of the clinical signs I described. So it, you know, if you're gutting it and it's got red intestines, um, you know, depending on where you shoot it, it may have blood in the thorax anyways, but if it has any of the, the signs that uh, I described, or you're worried that it's unhealthy in another way, then yes, I would like samples. The best samples to collect are lung, frozen, just a, a chunk the size of half an apple in a Ziploc bag, um, and a section of intestine, also frozen. Um, but while we're talking about samples, we always want samples of deer heads for chronic wasting disease surveillance, which is, as many of you probably know, a huge concern for us in BC. We don't yet have it here, but we want to make sure we keep it that way. So if you're going to be collecting samples, then we'll, we'll take heads, please. <laughs> and is there a place that we should... Um, like if they're going to be drop off locations where we can drop off samples or how do we get them to you? You can drop them with a, at a regional office, um, but the, really the best way is to contact me directly and say that you have samples and I can coordinate either getting a, a regional person to collect them from you um, or get them to me directly. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So I find it really interesting, actually, uh, Kylie, uh, I, you know, for some reason I had, I had understood it to be more fatal and I did not realize that they can develop some herd immunity to something like that. Yeah, so that's good news. It is good news. And, and we don't know, you know, it, it, it's rapidly fatal in a lot of cases, but we don't know how many animals are becoming infected and recovering. So that's where hopefully this this testing of antibodies from live animals will help us answer some of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it uh, yeah. does appear that some immunity is building up anyways, just with the, the case count decreasing over the last year. Right. Do you think that this is something that you're going to continue to expand, you know, in terms of testing and monitoring for, for Blacktail, and, and especially if it does start to head out to other parts of the province? Yeah, for sure. And so this is where I and we and the Wildlife Health Program do rely heavily on, on hunters and other people that are either observing or seeing or accessing wildlife, sorry, um, and backcountry areas to report things like these. So there's you know, four of us make up the Wildlife Health Program and we work with the conservation officers and the wildlife biologists, but we really can't be everywhere as, as much as the public can. So um, really what we do is respond to reports of, of abnormal findings from people that are that are seeing them. Um, and that's how we get most of the samples and information until you know we get to a point where there's a question being asked and we can do some research to to try and answer it. But um, most of the information comes from reports. Right, right. So it's really that reporting aspect of things that, uh, you know, and so, but then I guess my next question would be, if we start to push reporting, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> is your <laughs> office prepared to handle that with four <laughs> right. of you, right? Yeah, no, good question. Yeah. Um, and the, the short answer is no, but if, uh, you know, if we start seeing a huge case count in this, then, then that's something that we have to deal with and we expand to deal with that as we can, hopefully, um, yeah. or we prioritize. You know, so even with this last outbreak, while I was still collecting reports of sick and diseased animals, and that's gone into a database of information, I haven't been able to re respond to all of them. And so I've been prioritizing responding and sampling to animals or sampling animals in areas that it was previously undetected. So for example, as the disease spread north, I was only collecting samples from animals kind of at the northern boundary of the disease spread or the western boundary. Um, in areas that we already had positives from, they're a low, lower priority to test. Got it. Got it. So no danger of eating, obviously, something that's not sick. 
No, with so this disease, there's no evidence that it transmits to humans. Um, with any any wildlife disease or wildlife health issue, it's always advised that uh, you don't consume sick looking animals. Um, but yeah, this disease specifically, this virus hasn't been shown to infect humans. Got it. Just as uh, I was going back to some of our social media questions, so I think Jasmine's question has probably been answered. How does this affect the deer for harvesting and are they still edible? So obviously sick or displaying some of those symptoms and probably never a good idea to eat regardless of whether it's positive or not, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. foamy Thank mouth and... And, yeah. bloody, and bloody feces is uh, never going to be a good thing. So, That's yeah. So we do we do think it's entirely possible that this disease could spread into into the rest of BC. It could, yeah. And this is just where we have to be careful in what we move around. Um, it try and prevent that. Um, I guess it, you know deer movement from the island to from Vancouver Island to the Gulf Islands and the mainland maybe isn't happening as that much. Um, and yeah. so that direct spread is possibly low risk. I'm not sure how many deer swim across, but uh, yeah. and, and with it being often rapidly fatal, they may not be surviving for the, you know, well enough to make that trip unless it's a very early infection. So we do yeah. have a bit of a, a geographical barrier there but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some cases on the on the coast of the mainland if this continues. Yeah yeah no kidding. So what kind of support can you know you've got observe anything that looks suspicious um, you know if, if a hunter harvests something frozen lung frozen intestine heads for CWD how much CWD testing are you guys doing on the island? Not very much, um, and that's, so most of our testing in BC is in the mandatory submission zones in the, or uh, management units in the Kootenays, yep. along those high-risk areas along the border, but we do want heads from all over the province, so we, we have cases every year where positive meat is brought in from Alberta or other jurisdictions, and it's often not detected until a it gets to or not reported until it gets to Vancouver Island or somewhere else in the province. And so there's always risk that that ends up in the environment somehow. Um, and we may have a positive case that pops up somewhere totally unexpected, so not along a border. So we really do want heads from all over the province and we're trying to get those numbers up so that we do have the power to detect a positive if it is there, right? And if it, if it exists, the more that we can sample, the more likely we're gonna to be to detect it. So yeah, yeah, we want heads from all over the province. Yeah, Any so increasing that, increasing that there as well. I know in the Okanagan here, I think our goal is 300 um, samples this year, same with peace and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. it will be good. So, so what kind of, you know, the, it's the observing, the reporting, samples from an obviously sick animal um, or an animal in question even I guess for that matter and you can always decide when they bring you a baggie of lung. Uh, yeah. What else can we do to support, spread the word, be aware? Spread the word is a big one. So we as government or ministry of course we don't have a great outlet for that. We don't have social media and, and we're not very proactive with our messaging so we do really rely on groups like this and other user groups and interest groups that uh, to spread the word and educate themselves and tell their friends and get the word out. So that's awesome. Uh, awesome. We can work together on awesome. that. Yeah. Now, now do you, so with the presentation that you've done today, do you yeah. have anything sort of formally printed or or social media things that we could, you know, I know, I know you guys don't do social media, but we can, and we often just share, you know, those kind of government facts type of stuff. So, yeah, if you go on to, and actually, sorry, I didn't put the link in here, but if you go on to our, our wildlife health program page, 
yep. there are links to diseases of interest. So there's some fact sheets about this. Oh, good. Because I think that's where I grabbed the CWD um, yeah. from. So, you know, because we like to do, you know, we start up every once in a while, we'll do scientific Sundays for a certain disease and and then okay. um, just fire things out on social media that way for people to to be aware of. So, you know, honestly, it sounds like we really are helpless. It's likely not going to kill entire herds and no. they're going to develop some immunity. And it's going to be one of those things we're going to live with, with occasional cycles of, you know, fawn loss and and that sort of stuff. eh? Yeah, I think so. I think from what other places I've seen, that's the pattern. But, you know, it's just one more thing that's a stressor to our wildlife population. So in some areas that those are compounding stressors and uh, if yeah. we can reduce yeah. that, the better. Well, we certainly, you know, we certainly throw around the words cumulative effect. Yeah. And, and you know, and if we're, you know, fighting blue tongue and in sheep and AHD and now, you know, CWD. I mean, it just is, you know, everybody's radar and awareness of what's coming down the pipe and what's out there is just going to have to ever increase, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Understanding our, our role in all that. So a lot of these where, you know, we're seeing an increase in some vector borne or insect borne diseases and that's been attributed largely to climate change and shifting populations. But uh, yeah. you know, our role in causing that and in, in preventing that too. So, and, and one last thing that sort of tweaked me was you guys really aren't, you know, you weren't, did you identify residential deer with it? I know that that wasn't part of the population, um, you know, inventory that was being done by the biologists, but residential they're likely because they're dying in people's yards eh yeah and yeah that's like that's a good question and I was making that point is that most of our cases were from urban or semi-rural areas and that's for two reasons I think is that that's where most people live so there's more people seeing and reporting infected animals but it also tends to be where it where deer are in higher density because of access to food and uh, you know they don't have that predation pressure in urban environments, so they can persist at higher densities. So whether you know that's a, a true um, indication of the prevalence of in those areas, or whether it's a reporting bias, but uh, yeah, there were certainly some areas that had a really high high level. Um, you know. It, we keep getting questions about Oak Bay and and uh, just because their their urban deer are often talked about in their urban deer contraception project. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there was some die off in Oak Bay observed. There's been a lack of fawns, but again, they're they're going through a contraception yeah. treatment trial, so hard to attribute it totally to one or the other. Um, but other urban areas have seen AHD as well. Awesome. So I'm going to say to the audience, I haven't seen uh, more hands come up, um, but do feel free to chime in. Uh, Kylie, what else is coming down the pipe that we need to support or be aware of? You know, CWD, AHD, that sort of stuff. Anything else that we need to, you know, start looking for on the horizon? Yeah, thanks for asking. I appreciate it. Um, CWD is really the big one right now that we're trying to get sample numbers up for. Um, in the one area of BC around Merritt, and sorry, Kate would kill me, but I can't remember the management units right now, but we are doing a bovine tuberculosis surveillance program. Um, so deer heads are required for testing that as well. I think that's um, region three. We were doing some, uh, we were doing some, some lymph node sampling for bovine testing, and and that's actually a very positive thing because so far, if I've got my information correct, nothing positive in the, right. in the deer that's been found yet, and and now in the last year of of testing, so so hopeful. Yeah, very hopeful. Yeah, no, that's that's very that's true, and that's uh, great news. We do need to get those sample numbers up to confirm that again with right. the, the power to detect a positive if it, if it is there. Yeah, 
Um, but really just reporting anything abnormal that you see while you're out on the landscape. So as I say, we have limited capacity to detect things, but if we all you know, put our numbers together and uh, generate you, the public and hunters generate reports of what they see, then uh, that's the best chance we have to um, have get an early detection of an issue that's, that may be coming. That's awesome. Uh, Dave, I see you raised your hand. Give me a second. I'm going to uh, bring you up here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. With the uh, DNA testing done so far, yeah. is there uh, any indication, indication of possible genetic markers which could provide some information on why some deer may appear to be immune to these diseases? Yeah, good question. Not that I know of. Um, there may be in a research setting, so some of the jurisdictions that have had this virus longer. Um, the DNA testing that I was referring to is just looking for the virus DNA in tissues. So we haven't done any, in BC anyways, we haven't done any testing of the host deer DNA. Um, but in, in other species and other diseases, that is something that uh, we've looked at through different genomic studies, but just not for this one yet. So is the other question I had was any risk to, uh, with consumption of an infected deer? Not that we know of. There's no indication that uh, humans can be infected with this virus or domestic animals. Um, but it's always best to avoid eating animals that appear unhealthy or, or ill in any way. So if there are... If, there are symptoms or anything abnormal you find once you've harvested in an animal. It's best to either avoid avoid eating or wait for pest results before you decide to eat. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can I just take a minute here then and just ask you a little bit about blue tongue? Was that the first time that disease event had hit sheep in BC? No, no, there we've had a couple outbreaks before. Um, I think in 2018 was a fairly significant outbreak um, in a smaller area, not as many animals affected, and it wasn't as visible, I think was the part of it, is that it wasn't as quickly detected and, and the number of animals that died wasn't as large. Um, and I think there was a smaller outbreak, let's say 2011, something like that, that it was also previously detected. I don't know the strains that uh, cause disease in those cases. So with blue tongue, there's two different strains to, uh, I think there's six strains of blue tongue and a couple strains of EHD, which are very closely related. Um, and the strain that we had in BC this year was the same as what was found or sorry, last year, the same as what was found just south of the border. Um, and I, I don't know the relationship between strains and previous outbreaks, but it was not the first time. Certainly a significant outbreak last year, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and not much we can do with those ones when they're just a natural disease event and a die-off, right? No, exactly. No, no much to be done with those. And it, again, those are rapidly fatal diseases. So by the time we're seeing symptomatic animals, it's um, the no. loss. Yeah. yeah. Well, and part of that is just, you know, because they're in the forest where we're not mostly yeah. <laughs> or mountains or whatever. Exactly. Awesome. Well, I see no more raised hands. And honestly, for a turkey night and a Thanksgiving long weekend, um, you know, being able to wrap up a little bit earlier is never a bad thing. Uh, we've given people, I think, some food for thought, some education, and I'll reach out to you, Kylie, and just make sure that, um, that we, you know, that we are able to share appropriate information and try and get things out there and stuff like that. Um, we do have a one day event planned on the island next spring as well I I'll touch base with you about that and and have you come as a guest for that day as well and that'd be great Thank kind you. of meet people yeah meet people yeah. on the ground so yes so I want to just say thank you to everybody for joining us tonight happy Thanksgiving hope you all had an amazing long weekend hunting or hanging out with your family or 
eaten turkey because God knows I did last night. <laughs> I had turkey coma within a half an hour of finishing dinner. It was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is I didn't cook this year, so I was thrilled with that. <laughs> Anyways, good stuff. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. We will have this webinar um, available on our website and YouTube channel within the next day or two. So thank you very much. It was Thanks. good to see you again. You we'll too. Good night. Good night.